it's so good to see all of you here, and I'm, I'm glad I'm back. <laughs> no. So we're going to start out singing something a little upbeat. We're going to start singing When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 Trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. Called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there let us labor for the master till the dawn and setting sun let us talk of all his wonders love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder it's called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there, I'll be there, and you will too. <laughs> you may be seated. <clears throat> Our next song is Don't You Know It's Time to Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Psalm 150, verse 6. Don't you know it's time to praise the Lord in the sanctuary of His Holy Spirit? So set your mind on Him and let your praise begin and the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord. His people. He loves to hear us call upon His name. So set your mind on Him and let your praise begin, and the glory of the Lord will fill this place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. your mind on him and let your praise begin and the glory of the Lord will fill this place praise the Lord 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 praise the Lord, praise the Lord.
we ready to praise him? Amen. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, our next song is Have I Decided to Follow Jesus? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I have, I have decided, decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. No turning back. No turning back. <laughs> My apologies. Wrong scripture, wrong song. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, we went with some timing right wrong there. Wrong scripture, wrong song. <laughs> That's okay. But anyway, hold double sing. Hold the mic up to you. Therefore, my beloved. <laughs> Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We worship and adore you, bowing down before you. Sing praise and sing
we just love worshiping you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your presence in our lives, Lord, guiding us and leading us their way, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with Pastor Rick as he gives us the message today. Let it sink in our heart. Let us use it for thy glory in every way. And ask it all in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew, we're going to be looking at a portion of Scripture in chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, and then also in chapter 18, verses 21 through 25. <clears throat> We're living in a world today that's pretty chaotic. A lot of negative things we hear going around the world, but there's also a lot of positive things as well. As believers in Christ, we know what the end has in store for us. We know where we're going to be when we leave this world. But as long as we're here, we need to be faithful in fulfilling the calling that God has given to us. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was very clear that we are ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. Y'all know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is a spokesperson, a representative of the individual that sent them. President will send ambassadors to different countries. They will serve in that capacity as an ambassador, and they're representing the president of whatever country has sent them there. We are living in a world that's not our home. It's a foreign world to us. Our home is in heaven. But we're here as an ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as a uh, head of state, a, a president or prime minister or whatever would give that ambassador the words that he wants them to share with that country, so God has given us the words he wants us to share with this country we're living in. It's called the, the, the message of reconciliation. As ambassadors of Christ, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, our responsibility and, and our whole uh, ministry on this earth should be to reconcile the lost to God. To be reconcilers. To bring the lost to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ so that they can be reconciled to God. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. But God has not just, just given us the, the, the job of an ambassador and, and given that responsibility to be a minister of reconciliation. He has also given us the word of reconciliation. And so that's what we need to be doing in these last days that we'll be living in. And in order to do that, as believers, we need to walk in such a way that we have a balanced life. And by balance, by, by, by being a balanced believer, and that's the title of our message this morning, how to become a balanced believer, by being a balanced believer, what I'm saying is that, that we can't be so far to the right that, that we're just shoving religion down people's throat. And we can't be so far to the left that we're just condoning everything that's going on in the world. We can't be in the middle with one foot in heaven and one foot in the world. We've got to be straight on with God in our walk with Him. And we've got to balance our life. Because there are certain things going on in the world today that, that we condemn, we don't condone but we can't be so antagonistic that we push people away from the Lord. Our job is to draw people to Christ. Not repel, but to draw them. And so how can I become a balanced believer in my life? 
and accomplish all that God wants me to accomplish in my life. So far, in our study, as we've gone on this path to a to powerful living, and I think that's so important for us, we, I want to live a, a life that's powerful for the Lord. And in, in order to do that, we've gone on this path to powerful living. So far, what have we, what have we seen? We've witnessed uh, Peter catching a huge number of fish. We have witnessed him walking on water. And, and we've, we've also seen him going from making this, this great confession of faith to making this, this great downfall. Jesus has been teaching his disciples through miracles and teaching uh, other folks too as well, through miracles, lessons, questions that he's been asking them, and testing. Remember, we talked about before in our last lesson about they were in the storm, and, and, and a lot of times storms come into our lives as a way of testing. When God gives us a job or responsibility, are we going to obey? When we read the Word of God, when we hear the Word of God being taught, are we going to apply it to our lives in obedience to His Word? Those are the testings that, that God gives us sometimes, and He does that sometimes through storms in our lives or situations that come up that we need to respond and respond in the right way. So now, Peter and the other disciples are ready for the next lesson. What is their next lesson? Well, their next lesson they learn through the transfiguration. So in our lesson today, we will learn how to become a balanced believer as we travel into uh, this path of powerful living. Let us take a look at Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them on a high mountain by themselves. And as he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if you wish let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice, out, uh, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Here we have the story of the transfiguration. And in, in this story, we learn how uh, to become balanced believers. The first, the first thing is this. The first thing we must do is this. We must balance worship with work. We must balance worship with work. We find that in the first four verses. Jesus' disciples are, are now beginning to understand that he truly is the Christ, 
the son of the living God. And, and so they're now ready for the next level of training. Jesus has been uh, telling them all along about his need to uh, suffer and to die. But they need to realize that his death will not be the end of his existence. So Jesus tells them that some of them will not experience death until they see him coming in his kingdom. He says in Matthew chapter 16, over in chapter 16, verse 28, he says this, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then, according to Matthew 17, verse 1, it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. On a high mountain. Probably this was Mount Hebron. Understand Mount Hebron is uh, 9,400 feet high. It's pretty high, isn't it? Now, I want you to compare that. Consider Mount McLaughlin, the big one there. That mountain is 9,465 feet high. 65 feet higher than, than Mount Hebron. So you can imagine how high Mount Hebron was. Now, it, it doesn't mean that they went clear to the tippy top. They were on one of the spurs of, of, of the mountain. But they, uh, it, you could call that mountaintop experience. They were on the mountaintop. Uh, notice what happens in verse 2. In verse 2 it says, As he was transfigured before them... His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Now, normally, Jesus would be wearing homemade clothing, uh, and, and he would just look like an ordinary Galilean peasant. But here, his deity shines through, and Peter sees Jesus, the Son of God, in his glory. This is what the Bible, the Bible calls the Shekinah glory of God. The word Shekinah, by the way, is a, it's a Hebrew word. And it means the, the manifestation of divine presence. According to Christianity.com, Shekinah glory, and I quote, Shekinah glory is a visible appearance of God on earth whose presence is portrayed through a natural occurrence. The word Shekinah is a Hebrew name meaning dwelling or one who dwells. Shekinah glory means he caused to dwell, referring to the divine presence of God. When, when God's presence was here, there was the Shekinah glory. That shone brightly. So here we have confirmation, really, of Peter's confession in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, where he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And remember what we said about Jesus? Jesus is his name, but Christ is his title. And the word Christ means Messiah. He is Jesus, the Messiah. Now that word transfigured, it's a Greek word, metamorpho. We get our English word metamorphos from, uh, from that. Uh, it's used to describe the transformation of, of a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. And, and, and it, it is a reference to an outward change that happens from within. Caterpillar goes into a cocoon. And within, there's this change that takes, a, takes place. And outwardly appears, not that ugly caterpillar, but a beautiful butterfly. It's a change, that, 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 uh, the outward change that happens from within. And, and that's the same word that we find in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when it tells us that do not be 
conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's the same word as being transformed. Be transformed. And how do we become transformed? It says, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What that means is that we're to change from the inside out. And how do we do that? By renewing our minds. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. See, what we allow to enter our minds will get into our heart. That's the inside. And what is in our heart will determine our attitudes, which determine our actions. That's the outside. It's just like what's happening in some of the schools that we mentioned earlier in our prayer request this morning, some of the uh, local, some of the uh, uh, secular schools and, and, and some of the even Christian schools, how they're allowing this game to be played that is, you know, inviting evil spirits to come in. It's sort of like playing on the Ouija board. And what happens is that gets into the minds of these young kids. And what gets into their minds gets into their hearts. And think also about kids that, that, are spent, that spend most of their time on video games. Uh, they, from the time they get up to the time they go to bed, they've got that, that, that machine looking at them, staring them square in the face, and they're playing video games or trolling the Internet. Things going into their minds that ought not be there. And when it gets to their minds, what happens? It'll make that 18-inch travel right down to their heart. And what is in their hearts will determine their attitudes, which determines their actions. You want to know why kids have so much anger issues today? Why kids have so much uh, 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 resentment towards authority today? Rebellion against authority today? Because of what they're allowing in their minds to get to their hearts, which determines their attitudes, which determines their actions. We are transformed, folks, by the renewing of our minds. And how do we do that? By reading God's Word, allowing the positive things to go into our minds, by hearing what is being taught from the Word of God, and then taking that and applying it to our lives. Let that seed of the Word of God be planted in our hearts and produce a growth. And from that growth, we have the right attitude, we have the right actions. Hearing God's Word as it is being taught and then applying it to our lives causing that, that inward change that will produce an outward change. Now let's go back to the mountaintop and identify those two Old Testament saints that are talking with Jesus. According to Matthew 17, verse 3, we're told that they are Moses and Elijah. Now, both of these men understand something. Both of these men had an incredible experience with God on a mountaintop. Remember, Moses had an experience with God on Mount Sinai over in Exodus chapter 20. And Elijah had this, this experience with God on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, understand something here. Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. And also, something here that I find intriguing, and some of you probably already know this, but you think about Moses. Moses died, and God buried him. And then think about this. Elijah Elijah was just taken up into heaven. I think I 
want you to think about that for a minute. Moses dies and is buried. God takes Elijah up into heaven. Could this mean that Moses is symbolic or represents those Christians, those saints who die in Christ before the rapture? And Elijah is symbolic or represents those who are alive at the rapture, is carried up into heaven? I don't know, but it sure seems like it's a pretty good picture of what's to come. What Paul say in Thessalonians, those who are dead in Christ will arise and those who are alive will meet them and be carried up in the air to meet Christ. Matthew tells us that they talk with Jesus, Moses and, and um, Elijah. But you know what? Matthew doesn't tell us what they talked about. What did they talk about? Well, if you look at Luke chapter 9, verses 30 and 31, you find out what they talked about. It says, And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke listen to this, spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They talked about his death, burial, and resurrection. Talk about the coming pending death of Christ. I can imagine Moses being excited because he's been waiting for 1,400 years now, and Elijah's been waiting waiting for over 800 years for Jesus' final sacrifice for the sins of mankind to take place. Their very presence, I believe, signifies the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the promised Messiah. And according to Matthew 17, uh, verse 4, when Peter witnesses all of this, He looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, that's good for us to be here. Let us, and some uh, translation says, I will make, but he says, let us, if you wish, let us make three tabernacles. We'll make one for you and we'll make one for Moses and we'll make one for Elijah. You see, I believe Peter wants to stay on that mountaintop with those three. That would have been my my wish. Oh, just let me let me hang around here. Let me stay here with Jesus and Moses and Elijah. He doesn't want to go back to the hard work, to the suffering, to the heartaches, to the dealing with the storms of life. And besides that. He doesn't want to go back to Jerusalem knowing what awaits Jesus in Jerusalem. Guys, listen, we we must always be willing to come down from the mountaintop in order to minister to those in the valley. It's easy to be skewed in our Christian lives But we must keep a balance between inspiration and perspiration. Between worship and work. It's so tempting. It's so tempting just to attend worship services and and, and, and Bible studies and never do any ministry. To go to church on Sunday morning and then to go out and work throughout the week And then to go back to church or Bible study on Sunday morning. And then to go out and do the same thing the next week. Not ministering to those around us that are in need of ministry. Mountaintops are important. But mountaintops should never be an end in themselves. And that's the reason I believe James tells us in James chapter 1 verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. 
When we just come in and just hear the word of God and we go out and do nothing about it, we're hearers only, not doers. And the Bible says, James tells us this, when you do that, you're deceiving yourselves. That's why he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If we just go to Bible study or to conferences or listen to Christian radio and TV and worship, it's a terrible waste of our time if these things don't motivate us to do the work or ministry for the Lord. I've seen, I've gone to a lot of Bible conferences, a lot of pastors' conferences, and I've seen some who have gone and they've gone sort of to take a little mini vacation, to get away from things. And, and they've gone, they sit through the conferences and everything, and they go back home, and it's business as usual. And I've seen some men, and this has happened to me before, I've gone back to the, to the conferences, I've soaked in what is there, I applied it to my life, and I came back all excited. And then I'm having to be reminded of the fact that, that Pastor, we didn't go to that conference with you. Then you're coming down here and dumping all that on us, and we don't understand what's going on. But that, that's what happens with a lot of folks when we, we go to Bible study or, or worship service, and then we just go out and do nothing. There's got to be a balance there. Mountaintops are important, but they're never going to end to themselves. The Bible says that we're ambassadors. We are ambassadors in this world. 2 Corinthians 5.20. And, and, and God has given us this, this ministry of reconciliation. He's given us the message of re reconciliation. What is the message of reconciliation? It's the kingdom gospel. That's what we need to be spreading around the world. We must be ministering in this world, seeking to reconcile the lost to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the kingdom gospel. In a nutshell. And that's what we must be proclaiming to the world. There's no other way to heaven except through faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. No other way. So to become a balanced believer, first of all, we must balance wor worship with work. We come to worship. We come to hear the word of God. But we need to go out into the mission field. And that's our mission field. We need to go out into the mission field and we need to work. We need to do what Paul says in, in Acts chapter 26. I believe it's verse 20. He says, repent and turn to God and do works befitting your repentance. We need to do the work. Not just the worship. Secondly, we must balance information with declaration. Information with declaration. Verses 5 through 9, we find this. In verse 4, here we have impulsive Peter. Always jumping to conclusions and, and running ahead of the cart. Making a big mistake here by suggesting that he should build three tabernacles. The implication would be that Jesus and Elijah and, Mo and Moses are all equal to one another. And we know that's not true. There's no one equal to Christ. He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the very son of God. He is God in the flesh. And there's no one equal to or above him. And then a voice comes down from heaven. It's out of a cloud. And it says, this is my beloved son 
in whom I am well pleased, hear him. Now this is the second time in Scripture that God speaks from heaven stating that Jesus is his son. The other time was at his baptism. You'll recall that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. It says, when Jesus was baptized, when he came up out of the water, there was that voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we're given instructions to listen to him, to hear him. So now when the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, hear this, they're greatly afraid. And they fall down, face down to the ground. But then Jesus comes up and he touches them. And he says, arise, don't be afraid. And when the disciples look up, what do they see? No one but Jesus alone. Moses and Elijah are not there anymore. It's just Jesus. Why is that? Why is that? Give it some thought. I believe it's because of this. Jesus is all they need. Jesus is all we need. What we need most in our lives is Jesus Christ. Paul declares in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, that all our needs are met by God according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Whatever need I have in my life, God can meet that need but he's going to do it through Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know why? Because Jesus is all I need. Jesus has all that I need. Not what I want, but what I need. He has all, and is all that I need. So now as they're, as they're coming down from the mountain, according to verse 9, Jesus says, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. By the way, guys, I don't want you to tell this, what just happened, to anyone until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Keep this between us. I believe he told them that because, see, it's not the transfiguration that he wanted to talk to them about. It was the crucifixion and the resurrection. And that is the very essence of the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of mankind. Jesus Christ rose from the dead that we too might have eternal life. That's the essence of the gospel. And that's why after his resurrection, I believe he tells, he tells them in Mark chapter 16 and verses 15 and 16, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says, this is it. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That is balancing information with declaration. We take the information and then we declare it to the world. So do you want to become a balanced believer? If so, you must balance worship with work. You must balance information with declaration. And then thirdly, we must balance being forgiven with forgiving others. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through, 20, through uh, 35. Listen to these. 
Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. <clears throat> then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was about to pay, as he was not able to pay, I'm sorry, but as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him his debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he heard, called him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. We must balance being forgiven with forgiving others. Because sometimes later, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Peter approached Jesus. He says, how many, how many times do I need to forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, the rabbis were teaching that three times was enough. So, Peter seems pretty generous here. And, and, and doubling it and then adding one to it. Also remember this, seven times. Seven is the number for completeness. However, Peter isn't anywhere close to the right answer. In verse 22, Jesus said, I, did not, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Do the math. 70 times seven. Seven. And in order to illustrate the importance of forgiveness to Peter, Jesus tells that parable that we just read about the unforgiving doubt debtor. Here we have a servant. He's about to be tossed in prison for his unpaid debts. He successfully begs for mercy. From his master. He owes a debt. 10,000 talents. By the way. That's the equivalent of, a, of, of, of millions of dollars. In today's currency. Then. That forgiven servant. Refuses. To forgive a fellow servant. Who only owes him. 
A hundred denarii. That's only about three months' wages. And he has him thrown in prison. Now being told about what he had done, the master calls for the unforgiving servant. And he has him sent to prison to be tormented until he repays every denarii that he owes. Basically, that's a life sentence. Jesus ends this parable with a very somber warning in verse 35. In verse 35, he says this. <clears throat> so, my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. That word translated forgive means to send away. An unforgiving spirit, folks, listen, an unforgiving spirit harbors resentment and, and, and bitterness and even hatred. When we forgive, we send away those feelings and attitudes and we replace them with love. If we refuse to forgive, we become self-tormentors, tormenting ourselves with feelings of resentment and, and bitterness and jealousy and hatred. Unforgiveness will cause that in a person's life, and it will have a physical effect on people as well. Forgiveness is never easy. I understand that. C.S. Lewis said this, Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. It's so true. It is doubly hard when the one who hurts us expresses no remorse. But we should remember this. I want you to remember this. Forgiveness does not depend on the character of the offender, but on the character of the offended. Forgiveness does not depend on the character of the offender, but on the character of the offended. Few things determine whether or not we can have a path to powerful living like our willingness to forgive. When you find it hard to forgive, remember this question that's found in Psalms 130, verse 3. It says, If you, Lord, should mark, that is, if you should take note of or keep a record of, says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities or mark our sins, oh, Lord, who could stand? Folks, we're all debtors to God. Every one of us. But we have nothing in which to repay our debt. I think that's what makes verse 4 of that particular Psalm 103, so wonderful. It says this, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. That word translated feared means really to revere. It's a reverential fear, an awe, if you will, that is a result of, of feeling our own unworthiness in God's Divine, majestic presence. Listen. God does not keep a tally of all of our sins. God's not sitting up there keeping a score of all of our sins. God did away with all of our sins altogether on the cross at Calvary. The Bible says in Micah chapter 7, verse 19, He will again have compassion on us 
and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And in Psalm 103, verse 12, we're told, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he, that is, so far has God, removed our transgressions or our sins from us. But we're not to take lightly. We're not to take lightly the grace of God in his provision for forgiveness. The person who has been truly forgiven of his sins will realize the magnitude of God's grace and will remain grateful for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for his sins. And he will live in fear, that is, in reverential awe of God. The Bible says in Psalm 128, verses 1 through 4, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you will be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house and your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. That is balancing being forgiven and forgiving others. Remember part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts, our sins, as we forgive others. How do you forgive others? Is there someone you need to forgive? Is there someone that you're harboring some bitterness or anger against, towards? Let it go. Let the love of God flow through. Because that's what grace is all about. Remember, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved us and because of God's love for us, there was grace. And because of grace that came from God's love, there was mercy. And because there was mercy, there was salvation. Let us remember that. Let us go and, and, and live a balanced life. Be a balanced believer in your life. Balance worship with work. Don't just take what we've heard here this morning and, and go out and have a happy week and come back next week. But apply it. Live by it. Balance information with declaration. Take what you hear. Take what you read in your your Bible readings and apply it and share it with others. And then balance being forgiven with forgiving, forgiving others. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your proclamation of your word. Thank you for the principles that we learn, Father, from your word that help us to walk in your ways. And Father, on our path to powerful living, we want to become balanced believers. God help us to become balanced believers. Help us, Lord, to balance worship with work, to truly worship on that mountaintop and then to get back down in the valley and in order to, to work the ministry that you've called us to. Help us, Father, to balance information with declaration, reading and, and hearing your word and then applying it to our lives and proclaiming it to others who need to hear it also. Father, help us 
to balance being forgiven and giving forgiveness. May we learn to forgive others as you have forgiven us unconditionally because of love and grace. Let us have mercy. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Man, God bless you. Let's stand together as we're dismissed. And let's also thank the Lord for the food that we're about to receive and ask him to use that to give nourishment and strength to our bodies and thank those whose hands have prepared that wonderful food. Amen? Let's <laughs> praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you, and I'll see you in just a few minutes.